This is strictly for educational purposes and commentary of biblical and secular historical literature. So enjoy. Universal Center for Renovation Historical Israelites. Subscribe, like, and share. The Diversion of an Assyrian King by Arthur Bridgman, 1878. Who were the Assyrians and where are they today? Tiglath Pileser III, King of Assyria. Tiglath Pileser of Assyria invades Israel in 738 BC. 2 Kings chapter 15 verse 19 through 22 Assyria invades Israel in 738 BC. The capture of Estatu by Tiglath Pileser III, British Museum. The city of Astartu, Astaroth Carnaum, 730 to 727 BC. This is the first of the exile of the Israelites into the Assyrian captivity, 2 Kings. Chapter 15, verse 29. Ten tribes, northern kingdom. Tiglath Pileser III. Tiglath Pileser III was the first Assyrian king named in the Bible. He is called Paul, which was his name before he seized the throne and adopted a throne name. Tiglath Pileser III. The north tribes of Zebulon and Naphtali was conquered by Tiglath Pileser III and made into Assyrian provinces. Ten tribes of Israel goes into exile. Biblical Assyria was at its peak during the time of Jonah, just before the fall of Israel in 722 BC. See Jonah chapter 1, verse 1. In 733 BC, Tiglath-Pileser of Assyria invaded Israel and captured Galilee. See 2 Kings chapter 15, verse 29. Two years later, he captured Damascus and killed King Rezin of Syria. In 724 BC, King Shalmaneser V of Assyria laid siege to Samaria and Israel fell to the Assyrians two years later. See 2 Kings chapter 17, verse 5 through 6. In 720 BC, Samaria the capital city of Israel fell to the Neo-Assyrian Empire. The Israelites' captives were resettled in the Karbar region and the cities of the Medes. Israelites resettled in the Karbar region and the cities of the Medes. Siege of Lachish from the British Museum. Assyria continued to harass the southern kingdom of Judah after the fall of the northern kingdom of Israel 
and 722 BC. See 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 13. The palace of King Sennacherib at Nineveh, built in 700 BC, was described at the time as a palace without a rival. Stone carvings on the walls told of Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem in 702 BC. See 2 Kings chapter 18, starting with verse 17 through chapter 19, ending at verse 36. 701 BC, siege of Lachish, Judah, Benjamin, and Levi, southern kingdom by the Assyrians. Northern Kingdom, Southern Kingdom, all ten tribes taken into captivity or exiled by the Assyrians and some members of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi. Some, not all members of the tribes of Judah, Benjamin, and Levi deported or exiled from their homeland by the Assyrians. The Lachish Reliefs are a set of Assyrian palace reliefs narrating the story of the Assyrian victory over the kingdom of Judah during the siege of Lachish in 701 BCE. Carved between 700 and 681 BCE, as a decoration of the southwest palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh in modern Iraq. The relief is today in the British Museum in London. Source Wikipedia Lachish Reliefs. The single inscription which identifies the location depicted in the reliefs reads Sennacherib the mighty king, king of the country of Assyria, sitting on the throne of judgment before or at the entrance of the city of Lachish. Lachisha, I give permission for its slaughter. King Sennacherib, victory over the kingdom of Judah. The Lachish Reliefs. The reliefs were a decoration inside the palace of Sennacherib in Nineveh. Ten tribes of Israel, Northern Kingdom, Jehu, on the Black obelisk of Shalmaneser III. This is the only portrayal we have in ancient Near Eastern art of an Israelite or Judean monarch source. Wikipedia's article, Jehu. Lachish Reliefs, Southern Kingdom of Judah, Jews. Woolly hair. Southern Kingdom and straight here, Northern Kingdom. Israelites. The complete works of Josephus, chapter 12. How Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyria, came to the assistance of Ahaz and laid Syria waste, and removing the Damascenes into Media place other nations in their room. Hereupon King Ahaz, having been so thoroughly beaten by the Israelites, sent to Tiglath Pileser, king of Assyrians, and sued for assistance from him in his war against the Israelites and Syrians and Damascenes. With a promise to send him much money, he sent him also great presents 
at the same time. Now this king, upon the reception of those ambassadors, came to assist Ahaz and made war upon the Syrians and laid their country waste and took Damascus by force and slew Rezin, their king, and transplanted the people of Damascus into the upper media and brought a colony of Assyrians and planted them in Damascus. He also afflicted the land of Israel and took many captives out of it. When Shalmaneser, the king of Assyria, had it told him that Hoshi, the king of Israel, had sent privately to Saul, the king of Egypt, desiring his assistance against him, he was very angry and made an expedition against Samaria in the seventh year of the reign of Hoshi. But when he was not admitted into the city by the king, translators note, A, this siege of Samaria, though not given a particular account of either in our Hebrew or Greek Bibles or in Josephus, was so very long, no less than three years, that it was no way improbable, but that parents, in particular mothers, might therein be reduced to eat their own children. As the law of Moses had threatened upon their disobedience, Leviticus chapter 26, verse 29, Deuteronomy chapter 28, verse 53 through 57, and was accomplished in the other shorter sieges of both the capital cities, Jerusalem and Samaria, mentioned in Jeremiah chapter 19, verse 9, Antiquities 9.4.4, in the latter, 2 Kings chapter 6, verse 26 through 29, End of translator's note. He besieged Samaria three years and took it by force in the ninth year of the reign of Hoshi. And in the seventh year of Hezekiah, king of Jerusalem, and quite demolished the government of the Israelites and transplanted all the people into Media and Persia among whom he took King Hoshea alive. And when he had removed these people out of their land, he transplanted other nations out of Kutha, a place so called, for there is still a river of that name in Persia, into Samaria and into the country of the Israelites. So, the ten tribes of the Israelites were removed out of Judea 947 years after their forefathers were come out of the land of Egypt and possessed themselves of this country. Chapter 14, The Complete Works of Josephus How Shalmaneser took Samaria by force and now he transplanted the ten tribes into Media and brought the nations of the Kuthians into their country and their room. Book 10, Chapter 1, The Complete Works of Josephus, How Sennacherib Made an Expedition Against Hezekiah, What Threatening Rapsheke Made to Hezekiah When Sennacherib was gone against the Egyptians. How Isaiah the prophet encouraged him. How Sennacherib, having failed of success in Egypt, returned thence to Jerusalem. And how upon his finding his army destroyed, he returned home and what befell him a little afterwards. 
It was now the fourteenth year of the government of Hezekiah, king of the two tribes, when the king of Assyria, whose name was Sennacherib, made an expedition against him with a great army and took all the cities of the tribes of Judah and Benjamin by force. When he was ready to bring his army against Jerusalem, accordingly, the Assyrian king took it and yet had no regard to what he had promised. But while he himself went to the war against the Egyptians and Ethiopians, he left his general, Repsheke, and two other of his principal commanders with great forces to destroy Jerusalem. The name of the two other commanders were Tartan and Repsheris. Now, when Sennacherib was returning from his Egyptian war to Jerusalem, he found his army under Rapshika, his general, in danger by a plague. For God had sent a pestilential distemper upon his army. And on the very first night of the siege, a hundred, four score, and five thousand with their captains and generals were destroyed. So the king was in a great dread and in a terrible agony at this calamity. And being in great fear for his whole army, he fled with the rest of his forces to his own kingdom and to his city, Nineveh. And when he had abode there a little while, he was treacherously assaulted and died by the hands of his elder sons. Herodotus, Wikipedia article, Herodotus, born 484, died 425 BC, was an ancient Greek historian and geographer from the Greek city of Haliacarnassus, part of the Persian Empire, now Badrum, Turkey. He is referred to as the father of history. From the book Herodotus, the histories. So when presently King Sennacherib came against Egypt with a great force of Arabians and Assyrians. Note number one, Sennacherib's attack on Hezekiah of Judea was made on his march to Egypt, Second Kings. Chapter 28. Note number two. This is Herodotus' version of the Jewish story of the pestilence which destroyed the Assyrian army before Jerusalem. Mice are a Greek symbol of pestilence. It is Apollo Smytheus, the mouse god, who sends and then ends the plague in Homer. It has long been known that the rats are carriers of the plague. New World's Encyclopedia Sennacherib Sennacherib The moon god is sin has replaced lost brothers for me was the son of Sargon the second whom he succeeded on the throne of Assyria 705 BCE to 681 BCE. In 701 BCE, an Egyptian-backed rebellion broke out in Judah, led by Hezekiah. In response, Sennacherib sacked a number of cities in Judah. He laid siege to Jerusalem, but soon returned to Nineveh with Jerusalem, not having been sacked. This famous event was recorded by Sennacherib himself, by Herodotus, and by several biblical writers. According to the Bible, the siege failed as the angel of Yahweh, Yahweh, went forth and struck down 185,000 men in the Assyrian camp. Second Kings, 
chapter 19, verse 35. The Assyrian accounts do not treat it as a disaster, but a great victory, not revealing the final outcome. Continuation of the New World Encyclopedia. Sennacherib's account. Biblical account. The Egyptian disaster, according to Herodotus. The Greek historian Herodotus, who wrote his histories, circa 450 BC, also speaks of a divinely appointed disaster destroying an army of Sennacherib in this same campaign while his supreme commander was being defeated in Jerusalem. Sennacherib's Annals, Wikipedia. Sennacherib's Annals are the annals of the Assyrian king, Sennacherib. The annals themselves are notable for describing Sennacherib's siege of Jerusalem during the reign of King Hezekiah. This event is recorded in several books contained in the Bible, including Isaiah chapter 36 and 37, 2 Kings chapter 18, verse 17, 2 Chronicles chapter 32, verse 9. Sennacherib's Annals, Wikipedia. Sennacherib's Annals of his military campaign, 704 through 681 BC, including his invasion into the kingdom of Judah, writing Akkadian cuneiform created circa 690 BCE, discovered from 1830, present location, final editions, in the British Museum, Oriental Institute of Chicago, and the Israel Museum. And Josephus, chapter 5. After what manner the posterity of Noah sent out colonies and inhabited the whole earth? Now they were the grandchildren of Noah, an honor of whom names were imposed on the nations by those that first seized upon them. Noah, Wikipedia article, Noah. The Genesis flood narrative is among the best known stories of the Bible. In this account, Noah labored faithfully to build the ark at God's command, ultimately saving not only his own family, but mankind itself and all land animals from extinction during the flood. Afterwards, God made a covenant with Noah and promised never again to destroy all the earth's creatures with a flood. Noah is also portrayed as a tiller of the soil and as a drinker of wine. Continuation of the Wikipedia article, Noah. Biblical narrative, 10th and final of the pre-flood antediluvian patriarchs, son to Lamech and an unnamed mother. Noah is 500 years old before his sons, Shem, Ham, and Japheth are born. The Genesis flood narrative is encompassed within chapter six through nine in the book of Genesis in the Bible. The narrative discusses the evil of mankind that moved God to destroy the world by the way of the flood. The preparation of the ark for certain animals, Noah and his family, and God's guarantee, the Noahic covenant for the continued existence of life under the promise that he would never send another flood. Table of Nations Genesis chapter 10 sets forth the descendants of Shem, Ham, and Japheth, from whom the nations branched out over the earth after the flood. Family Tree 
Adam, Eve, Seth, Noah, Shem, Family Tree, Adam, Eve, Seth, Adam and Eve, Russian icon, Noah, Shem, Noah, Shem, Ham, Japheth, and their wives. The Complete Works of Josephus, Chapter 3, Concerning the Flood, and After What Manner Noah Was Saved, and an Ark With His Kindred. When the rain ceased, the ark rested on the top of a certain mountain in Armenia. This Apobetiuron, or place of descent, is the proper rendering of the Armenian name, the first place of descent, and is a lasting monument of the preservation of Noah and the ark upon the top of that mountain. The place of descent for the ark being saved in that place. Its remains are shown there by the inhabitants to this day. Now, all the writers of barbarian histories make mention of this flood and of this ark, among whom is Beresis the Chaldean. For when he is describing the circumstances of the flood, he goes on thus. It is said there is still some part of this ship in Armenia at the mountain of the Cordians, and that some people carry off pieces of the bitumen, which they take away and use chiefly as amulets for the averting of mischiefs. Hieronymus, the Egyptian also, who wrote the Phoenician Antiquities, and Nicias, and a great many more, make mention of the same. Nay, Nicholas of Damascus, in his 96th book, hath a particular relation about them, where he speaks thus, there's a great mountain in Armenia over Manias called Baris, upon which it is reported that many who fled at the time of the deluge were saved, and that one who was carried in an ark came on shore upon the top of it, and that the remains of the timber was a great while preserved. Noah Russian icon. The Ararat anomaly is a structure appearing on photographs of the snowfields near the summit of Mount Ararat, Turkey, and advanced by some Christian believers as the remains of Noah's Ark. Picture of the Ararat anomaly taken by the U.S. Department of Defense in 1949. From Creations Dot com the Ararat Anomaly America's spy agency, the CIA, has for decades kept a growing nasier of classified military and spy satellite photos of a small patch of ice near the peak of Greater Mount Ararat. In about one in ten of those years, the ice melts back enough to expose what some have suggested are the remains of Noah's Ark. Lesser Ararat, Mount Ararat. Most searchers focus on this area, the Ararat Anomaly, superimposed Ark to scale. Lesser Ararat, Mount Ararat. Most searchers 
focus on this area, the Ararat Anomaly, superimposed Arctic scale, Mount Ararat, Erevan, Armenia, Mount Ararat, the resting place of the Ark of Noah. Shem Shem Wikipedia article Shem was one of the sons of Noah in the book of Genesis Asher Wikipedia article Asher Bible Asher was the second son of Shem the son of Noah Asher's brothers were Elam, Arphaxad, Lud, and Aram. Ashur, the Assyrians. Assyrian art, taken from the ancient capital of Nineveh, brought to Scotland by Schomburg Henry Carr, 9th Marquess of Lothian, attaché at Tehran in 1854, and Baghdad in 1855. Wikipedia article, Asher, Bible. Asher was the second son of Shem, the son of Noah. Asher's brothers were Elam, Arafaxad, Lud, and Aram. The first century Judeo-Roman historian Flavius Josephus also gives the following statement. Asher lived at the city of Nineveh, and named his subjects Assyrians, who became the most fortunate nation beyond others. Antiquities of the Jews, Assyrian people. Wikipedia, History of the Assyrians. The history of the Assyrians encompasses nearly five millennia, covering the history of the ancient Mesopotamian civilization of Assyria, including its territory, culture, and people, as well as the later history of the Assyrian people after the fall of the Neo-Assyrian Empire in 609 BC. The Assyrians So who are the children of Asher, the ancient Assyrians? today. Many accept the theory that the Todas have descended from the ancient Assyrians from the book The Music Hunter, the autobiography of a career, page 201. Todas, the well-marked Assyrian stamp of face from the book, The Todas, page 51. During late Assyrian times, there was perhaps a trading colony of people from Assyria in the Megiris and the Taurus are their descendants from the book Dravidinian and Negro African Ethno-Linguistic Study of Their Origin, Diffusion and Prehistoric Contacts and Common Cultural and Linguistic Heritage. Assyrioid, Assyrian civilization, Toda, source, human phenotypes, dot net. A phrenologist amongst the Todas, or the study of a primitive tribe in South India.
page 51. A most interesting people is this, to contemplate the well-marked Assyrian stamp of face, the totus. Toda people, descendants of the ancient Assyrians. Toda men, Toda women, the Toda, children of Ashar, the Assyrians. Toda men, descendant of the ancient Assyrian people. The Toda people, children of Shem's son Ashar. Ancient Assyrian musicians, Assyrian hairstyle, Toda people in front of their hut, circa 1870, ancient Mesopotamia type huts, Wikipedia, Mudhif. A mudhif is a traditional reed house made in the swamps of southern Iraq. The interior of an Iraqi mudhif. Mudhif, Iraq. Todahut, Nagiri. Mountains, India. The Toda are a colony of Assyrians living in southern India. Mudhif, Iraq. Ancient Chaldean hut. 700 BC, southern Iraq. Assyrian architecture. Assyrians were experts in the way of engineering and built colossal buildings. Many of the architecture was made out of brick and clay. They built forts for the military and made homes for families. Villages were built very close together as seen on the right. That village, however, was built on the outskirts of the Assyrian Empire, a small village built atop a mountain. The Assyrian terrain is and was made up of hills and dry plains. Clay was abundant and the architecture preserved well due to the lack of rain or snow. The Assyrians had understood the concept of how to build an ark and because of that became successful engineers. The picture to the right are as follows. Top Assyrian fought for armies to recruit. 
to bottom left, a Syrian village. Top right, a Syrian palace, mostly ruins. Bottom right, a Syrian temple, religious sanctum. Capital city of the Assyrians, Nineveh. Living in Ancient Mesopotamia, book. Series consultant, editor, Norman Bancroft, Hunt. The Rise and Fall of Assyria, 1420 to 609 BCE. The homeland of the Assyrians is a small region on the upper part of the Tigris. Bounded by its tributaries, the Great Zab and Little Zab. By about 1800 BCE, the earliest known Assyrian ruler, Ishmi Dagan and his son, Shamshi Adad I, have united the cities of Asher, Nineveh, and Arbil. Together with Nimrud, these cities formed the core of Assyrian civilization. Under their kings, the Assyrians build a huge empire which reaches its greatest extent between 1000 and 612 BCE, the period known as the New Assyrian Empire. Great engineers, the Assyrians are an aggressive military people who make enemies among their neighbors, as well as among their own subjects. With their formidable permanent army, the Assyrian kings usually win every battle and their glory and success are reflected in the magnificent palaces and cities they build. Among the most splendid are Khorsabad and Nimrud, decorated with painted stone carvings and monumental statues of winged bulls with the king's head. The Assyrians' chief god is Asher, after whom their main city is named. Like the Sumerians, the Assyrians build ziggurats for their gods with large sacred precincts around them. They are also great builders of roads for the army and of aqueducts to bring water into their cities from the surrounding hillsides. Constructed of mud bricks, the aqueducts allow water to flow downhill through clay pipes, waterproofed with a lining of bitumen tar. Assyrian engineers are the first to build paved roads and span valleys with aqueducts to bring water to the cities. A farming economy, the Assyrians' economy is centered around their fields, crops, and livestock. A large part of the population consists of peasant farmers who are dependent on the land they own or land they are employed to cultivate. Unlike Sumer, Assyria is a nation of farming villages and country towns with only a few large cities. For the majority of Assyrians, life is spent working on farms and rivers. This bas relief carving shows ordinary folk going about their daily task. In this case, harvesting grain and fishing in the Tigris. In Assyria, every aspect of life is linked to the king, whose power is absolute. The king is not a god, but his body emits a radiance that causes fear in his enemies on the battlefield. Anyone who wants to see the king, even the crown prince, must go through elaborate rites to make sure the omens are good. 
The king's palace is both the official royal residence and the seat of government. Assyrian slaves. King superintending removal of colossal bull. Forced migrations to Assyria's neighbors. Its most upsetting military policy is the mass deportation of subject peoples. Scholars often describe this policy as inhumane, yet it is important to consider it from the Assyrian point of view. Therefore, stability of the Assyrian way of life depends on relocating populations. The Assyrians do not break up ethnic groups or separate family members, and all deportees remain technically free persons, able to follow their own religious beliefs and speak their own language. All they are expected to do is express their loyalty to Asher. Supply and demand. This is a time when relocation of entire populations by migration is common. And so being forcibly moved is not as upsetting as it would be today. The deported people are sent to settle in places similar to those they came from and they are looked after. These are not forced marches and shackles and chains but well supervised movements during which the comfort and health of the people is important. In fact, they are often better clothed and better fed than many rural Assyrian families. In the countryside, the resettled population work alongside existing rural villagers and they have the same rights and obligations as anyone else, the Jews in exile. This issue of Assyrian deportation is emotive, mostly because it is the Assyrian family. Assyrian society is decidedly patriarchal. The husband and father's word is law, and the rights and liberty of women is restricted in comparison to those of other Mesopotamians. Assyrians have two indistinct social groups, free and non-free. Among the free citizens, there are many subtle levels of status that reflect the wealth and influence of an individual. Non-free status, although generally meaning slave, often indicates that the person is in a position of subservience to someone of a higher authority. The sons of poor families must report for military duty when required, while the sons of wealthy and noble families take up the duties of army officers. They might remain in a military career or later become local or central government administrators. When his father dies, the eldest son performs the rites. Reading a memorial service in front of the household sacred niche. This contains an offering table and an opening in the wall occupied by the house god. The master is removed from his deathbed and laid out ceremoniously on a stretcher to be taken to his grave. He's dressed in his finest robe and his right hand laid on a vessel containing the food he would need in the afterlife. 
along with him will go all his personal belongings, ornaments, weapons, and armor, favorite vessels, and his death, the Assyrian nobleman remained the great warrior he was in life. A man's property. In the privacy of their homes, both men and their wives go scantily clad, sometimes even naked. Outdoors, men generally wear a short tunic. An Assyrian nobleman usually has only one wife, but he is also allowed concubines, and as a result, hopefully, even more sons. Women are under the authority of the male head of the family. A girl's father and future father-in-law arrange her marriage between them, and she has no say in the matter. After the wedding, the bride comes under the authority of her husband as she moves to his household. As a wife, the girl has few property rights, even jewelry given to her as a marriage gift, an Assyrian soldier's life. Assyrian boys start their military life at the age of 16. The Assyrians are the first people to employ a professional standing army. It's carefully organized and trained. Kitted out with their basic equipment, raw recruits are herded towards their new life of order and rigor in the local military base where they will be made into the efficient soldier seen above. The Assyrian military camp, professional soldiers live on a military base or a Kal Mash Arati place for marshalling forces in the capital cities. Conscripts supplement the regular army in times of foreign war. These forces are raised from within Assyria, but also from southern Mesopotamia by provincial governors who are also responsible for providing provisions while the army is in their territory. By these means, it is possible to field an army of as many as 200,000 men. Cities of Splendor and Learning Between the 9th and 7th centuries BCE, Assyria's main urban centers are among the most splendid cities anywhere, each in its time the capital of a great king. Nineveh contains the finest library in the world. Library of Asher Banipal. The Assyrians. Toda people. The fate of Nineveh, Nahum. God is finished with Nineveh. Prophet Nahum, 660 to 630 BC. King of Assyria, nothing can heal you. Your wound is fatal. All who hear the news about you, clap. the city of Nineveh, 401, 2004. Subscribe, like, and share to be continued.